Sarah. We've got a lot of talent at this church. Won't you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we are thankful to be in your house. We're thankful for the son that you gave to us. We're thankful for the breath of heaven. Lord, I pray that you be with our nation, especially in the new year, especially in 2020, as many of us start going back to school, as many of us go back to work on Monday. Lord, I pray that you continue to go with us as we prepare for a new year, a new season, um, and all the newness that you will bring with that, God. Heavenly Father, Lord, we lift up those in our government and we ask for their wisdom and their protection and guidance. Lord, we lift up our first responders, our police officers and firefighters, those that sacrifice themselves for us. Lord, and we ask for you to be there with them. Heavenly Father, I pray as we get ready to explore your word today that something meaningful um, and something grace-filled will land in our hearts today. And may it be from you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, who is exhausted from Christmas? Who is glad that it's over? I just am curious, did anybody go to two Christmases or more? Just by a show of hands, if you did, did anybody do three Christmases or more? Four Christmases or more? We got, I think, one hand up. Okay, I think four was the max. I only got to go to three. I feel a little bit sad this year. Um, but when you've got family spread out, you have to travel to Christmas and to different places. Um, now, how many of you traveled for Christmas? Did anybody stay in town? Did everybody, tra did anybody travel far? Did anybody have a white Christmas? That hand went down fast. I'm sorry. I woke up this morning, and I was going to put on a sweater over this, and I thought it would be a real nice Christmas look. And I took my dogs outside, and it was so hot that I started just about sweating. Many people love Christmas, and they love uh, the, to romanticize Christmas. Um, Christmas has to be perfect. It can, it can serve as an escape from like the harsh realities of the year. It can serve as an escape from the darkness that comes in as winter takes over because we're lighting up our house. We're adding greenery to our house when outside everything is dying. A lot of people romanticize Christmas. They love it and it, they want it to be perfect. But I want to let you know, and I think Sarah did a great job of that, and our scripture reading this morning um, will point to this in a second, but for those at the first Christmas, it wasn't that romantic. It wasn't that clean. It wasn't that nice. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that Jesus came at Christmas time, and he came at a time when the world is cruel and the world can be harsh. Um, the truth of the matter is the powers of evil were at work when Jesus was born. Have you ever thought about that? When Jesus was brought to the earth, the powers of evil were at work, and they are still at work today. Think about that for a second. We don't live in a healed world just yet. Jesus came to a broken world, and he went into a hard situation. For today, I want us to kind of imagine ourselves living in the shadow of that holy manger, the idea that Jesus has been sent to us, that God is here with us. But I want you to make no mistake that it was an easy life. It was a dangerous world and a dangerous Christmas. Joseph and Mary are traveling many, many miles while she is how many months pregnant, right? They, there's no room in the inn. Nobody would give a pregnant woman a bed for the night. They make her give birth in the stables with the animals and she has to place her newborn baby in a manger, which is not that appealing. Last week, we focused on how Joseph, the father of Jesus, also didn't have it that easy. He was a righteous man. He prayed. He, um, he wanted to do right by God, but at the same time, he didn't understand what was happening in his life. Mary was pregnant, but he wasn't the father. But then an angel spoke to him. An angel charged Joseph to, to stay in the life of that child and to name that child Jesus. And what does Joseph do? He listens to the angel, right? As we're about to read in a little bit, the angel comes back to Joseph. And the angel charges Joseph to protect the Christ child. And I want you to think about this. Does baby Jesus really need protecting? Be honest with yourself. If you were to really ask yourself that, does baby Jesus 
really need protecting by somebody like Joseph, an 18-year-old kid who's never had a baby in his life. This is his first child, and he's been giving Christ the Messiah to take care of, right? Joseph, this father of sorts, comes along, and he is placed in a very dangerous situation. We're about to do our gospel reading, and we're going to continue with the Christmas story and continue reading in Matthew chapter 2. Um, before we get to that reading, though, I want to let you, I want to remind you of what has happened. Mary and Joseph have hit the road. They've given birth um, at, outside of the inn, and they've placed Jesus in the manger. Some time has passed. The wise men have shown up, and they've brought their gifts to give Jesus, the true gifts that he deserves, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But something else is happening, too, at this time. King Herod in the land is talking to the wise men, saying, tell me when you find this baby so that I might worship him as well, right? And we all know that King Herod wanted to kill Jesus. In our gospel reading this morning, I want you to take in the Christmas story, but I also want you to take in the trials, the trials that Jesus faced, the trials that Mary and Joseph faced, and maybe as we look at it, we'll see that Christmas really is not the most perfect, clean holiday, um, had the, the cleanest history origin story, but it says something important. Um, our scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 33. Jesus has been born. The wise men have brought their gifts off, um, but King Herod knows something is up, that baby Jesus is out there. It goes like this. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophets. Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity that were two years old and under, in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. It's a dark Christmas time, isn't it, church? It goes on. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take this child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and he went to the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. This is the word of God for us today, and this is a good word, but it is also, and I really wanted you to hear it, there's some hardness in this. This is the Christmas story, but there's children dying. I titled this sermon, New Life, New Seasons, because when Jesus enters the world, that is the new life that changes everything. That's the, that ushers in a new season for all of mankind. But let's not get romantic. Let's not get romantic. I really want you to hear me. Look at what we just read. Let's be sure that we see that the season that we are still in with Jesus is still the season of this world. Um, and this world is very dangerous. This world is filled with people that don't have the same commitment to God that we might have. But I like Joseph a lot. I like Joseph for this reason. He enters the world. He enters into this marriage with Mary and this child with Jesus. And all he does is he listens to God. Joseph seems to make no decision on his own without God directing him where to go when, at what time to leave. Have you ever got a message from somebody saying, could you come to my house right now? And you said, I'll, I'll take about 30 minutes. I got to get ready. In our scripture reading, Joseph is leaving at midnight. As soon as he wakes from the dream, it's time to go. Joseph is listening to God, not because God really wants him to do it right now, 
but because the world Joseph lives in is dangerous. Let's not romanticize it. Our world's dangerous too. I like Joseph, and I want you to notice that Joseph has one job, right? To protect and care for this baby. And he does it so good. Even though, even though Jesus is in the world, Joseph's life does not get easier. If you look at Joseph's life, it, it actually looks like it gets a lot harder. Would you want to uproot from your family, from your cousins, from your friends? Would you want to settle in a foreign country where you don't speak the language, where nobody is really on your side because you're an Israelite and they're an Egyptian? Joseph didn't want to do those things, but he had to, to protect Jesus. Even though Joseph's life was not easy, he still had Jesus there with him. And my point is this. Jesus in the world didn't make Joseph's life any easier, and it didn't cause people to not want to hurt him, and it didn't erase the worries from his mind. The evil King Herod, right? We've mentioned him a couple of Sundays now. He has heard about Jesus. He knows who Jesus is. He's at least the baby version. He's aware that a Messiah is born that threatens his power. And so he can't fathom the idea that somebody would rock his power, that somebody would come and assault what he has, touch what he has claimed for himself. So he has all the infants in Bethlehem murdered. Just kill them all, slaughter them all. This is not a Hallmark Christmas story. This is a Game of Thrones Christmas story. Uh, this is a Christmas story where we see real danger, real life's at risk, and we see Jesus um, and his worth and Joseph as very key, uh, important people. I think I've made this point, but I think when we read our Matthew 2 scripture reading, the first thing that I came across, the first thing that hit me, was that the world that we live in is cruel and dangerous. Life in this world, we can all be subject to somebody's evil plots. We can be subject to somebody's schemes against us. Um, powerful people can orchestrate attacks against us. We live in a world where not everybody walks on God's path. Not everybody wants to walk on God's path. Herod knew that a, a Messiah had been born, and he didn't want to worship it. He wanted to destroy it. Not everybody wants to follow God, and that's what makes navigating this world hard. Um, some people want to help the poor. Some people want to help themselves. Some people want to share everything. Other people only want to see what you have, so that way they can have a little bit more than you. There's something that we need to take from Joseph, though. The world is dark, but I don't want to leave you with that. Um, with Joseph, Joseph is able to navigate the dark parts of this world pretty well. Have you noticed that? Joseph is able to have a spiritual life where God is talking to him, ministering to him, guiding him. And Joseph didn't just develop this overnight. Our, our, last week, we did our scripture reading, and we found that the Bible called Joseph righteous straight off the bat because of his character, for what he did for his neighbors, because of his prayer, because his commitment to temple. You don't just call somebody who's a decent person righteous in the Bible. That's a big claim. Joseph is righteous in the Bible. Joseph has a spiritual life. The darkness of the world comes at him in unseen, way, unseen ways, but Joseph who prays, Joseph who goes to temple, Joseph who contemplates on God gets led by God when it when he needs it the most. I think one of the things that I take away from this is that Joseph and me are operating in messy worlds. But I want to be like Joseph. I don't want to miss the signs or the directions from God. Joseph only acts when God tells him to act. He only goes, and he does it immediately because he has faith, because he has a spiritual life that is tuned into God. He's on the look for God in his world. He's on the look for God in his dreams. Um, so let me ask you and let me ask myself some questions. Where do you look for God in the day to day? Do you look for God in the morning when it's quiet and the house is still and you have your cup of coffee? Do you look for God in the busyness as you run from task to task? Are you looking for God in those things? What parts of, you day, what parts of your day do you set aside for your relationship with God? Maybe it's not four or five hours, but maybe it's that hour drive to Savannah that you find yourself in deep contemplation about what God wants for your life. 
or you find yourself praying as you listen to music. What composes your spiritual life? What makes your spiritual life uh, yours? Do you read scripture? Do you pray? The reason we need a spiritual life is because we've been born into a fallen world just like Jesus. There's darkness around every corner, and yet God has come with us. God is guiding and directing and willing to walk with us as we go into actual dark places in the world. Um, I always kind of tear into the media, but I look at all news sources, and I see them talking about the darkness in the world. And there is a lot of darkness in the world, but I wish they would also have God's voice there too saying, but I'm here with you. As the news comes in that scares you, I am standing there with you. Are you listening? Are you looking? The world is dark, and so God sent his light. And at Advent and at Christmas time, we light candles because a light has been added to the world. We need a spiritual life because the world can be cruel. We need Jesus because we need a way to relate to God. We have a light inside of us that if we tend, that if we feed it, that if we minister to it, it will minister back. As we seek out Jesus in our life, he will seek us out in our decisions. We need a spiritual life because the world can be cruel, because people aren't always with God. Um, one of the things that I think about a lot, and sometimes I get asked about a lot, is, if God is real, how is the world so dark? Have you ever been asked that? Has anybody ever said, well, if God is so merciful and loving, how come there's so many wars? How come there's um, Jeffrey Epstein in this island? How come there's these terrible, awful things that happen all across the globe? How can a merciful God let that happen? The world is dark. I will agree with everybody on that. There are places where sin has entered and taken over areas. But I will say this. For years, humans, mankind, have gone to our own free wills. We've grabbed as much as we could grab. We've killed whoever stood in our way. We fought war. Year after year, wars after wars have come upon the human race. And yet, somehow, there are men and women that choose charity over selfishness. Somehow there are men and women being born in war-torn countries that choose sanctification over lust and corruption. Year after year, war after war, death after death, and yet God keeps pulling people forward and saying, I want to start something good in the world with you. Consider how in spite of centuries of sin, greed, and lust, cruelty, hatred, injustice, and yet humans still can recover each time. Each time we can lock hands, we can pray for each other, we can produce good men and women who will overcome evil. How could any of that be possible without a gracious and merciful God? How can anybody that's had the trauma of losing their parents ever be loving and kind to anybody else without a merciful and loving God. Whatever you are in today, whatever you are going through, however life is easy or however difficult life seems to be, whatever you're going back to on Monday morning, I want to challenge you to bring a spiritual life with you. Whether that's a prayer before you go into the meeting, whether that's a Bible in your office that you can turn to from time to time as you seek guidance and counsel. I want to encourage you to be on the lookout for your spiritual life and be on the lookout for God interacting and guiding you. And I want you to think about yourself like Joseph for a second. Could you be like Joseph? If God said go, would you go? If God said pray, would you pray? If God said serve, would you serve? Joseph was in tune with what God was asking. And I'm trying every day to be just as in tune as Joseph. And I hope that you do the same. I hope you make that your commitment for the new year, to have your spiritual life come to all aspects of your life. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you and we thank you for the gift of your Son, but Lord, we also thank you for the light in a world of darkness that you have given us. 
Lord, you were born into a sinful world. You died in a sinful world, and you resurrected in a sinful world. And yet you called men and women to stand with you in your kingdom. And you said that you would stand with us. Lord, may we not be afraid. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.